So let's start with uh, trade and advanced payments. When we, until now we've talked about trade and the trade account. We've, we talked about what happens where, when a country imports more than exports or vice versa. Uh, but the international position of the country is given and it is uh, portrayed, it is calculated in its overall balance of payments accounts. So this is a, 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 an internationally accepted um, way of measuring the flows and we'll see which kind of flows. It is comparable across countries and you can look at the evolution of the time. Uh, you can find data on the balance of payments in every country's individual financial statistics, or you can go to the World Bank data, the IMF data, the WTO data, and then you can compare the positions of different countries in terms of their balance of payments. Now, what does a balance of payments do? A country's balance of payment basically includes two things. Payments to foreigners and receipts from foreigners. In the simplest sense, that's what it is. That's what it calculates. And each international transaction enters the account twice. Once as a credit and once as a debt. And for those of you that have done accounting, or some of you I think are accountants also, uh, this double entry system should be rather familiar. For uh, the rest of us who are not accountants, I will go through how uh, this is done, and then I will explain the economic reasoning behind it, because it's one thing how we write the statistics, it's a different thing what they really mean in terms of the economics and the like. So the balance of payment accounts is actually composed of three separate accounts. There is the current account, which tracks the flow of goods and services between a country and the rest of the world. There is the financial account, which records all financial transactions between the country and the rest of the world. And there's a very small bit, which is a capital account. Uh, that's the smallest that records transfers or specialized capital. And usually, this is very, very small in the account. Now, let's take each of these. Oh, before I do that, let me give you a few examples so that you can understand what we're talking about. Let's say somebody goes to a store in the US and buys a Japanese DVD. And here I say imports it because the fact that he buys an input is as if he has imported it. So he buys a Japanese DVD and he uses that debit card. Okay? Uh, now the Japanese, as he pays, eventually the store pays the company and the Japanese producer deposits the funds in their bank account, let's say in San Francisco. Okay, they have a local bank account. Uh, so the bank credits the amount, the account by the amount of receipt. So, what, have, what do we have here? We have a DVD purchase that goes into the current account. Okay. It's a minus because it's an import. And then you have a credit, a sale of bank account by the bank. That goes into the financial account and it's a plus for free. So the two balance out. Double entry. Okay. You have imported something and you paid some money for it and, and it's counted in two different accounts. Second example. Let's say it's a US person invests, invests in the Japanese stock market and uh, they buy $500 uh, in Sony stock. Okay. Now, obviously, they do this through an American broker. So they pay an American broker. Eventually, the money gets to Sony, and Sony deposits the funds in its, in its Los Angeles. Uh, so the bank credits the account by the amount of deposit. So how do we show this? We have a purchase of stock that goes in the financial account as a minus 500 and the credit of in the bank account, in the financial account, I guess, of plus 500. So these are basically accounting definitions. Uh, there's not much economics for the time being here. This is just the way we record it. And sometimes it's counterintuitive. Uh, I've never found the uh, accounting terribly intuitive to do it in terms of Third example. Let's say US banks, now we're going out more money. 
uh, U.S. banks forgive a loan that they had given to uh, uh, the government of Argentina. Okay, it's 100 million. Through a process of debt destruction. We'll talk about debt destruction today or tomorrow. Uh, the U.S. banks who hold the debt therefore reduce the debt by crediting Argentina's bank accounts. Okay. So the debt forgiven, debt forgiveness is considered a non-market transfer. So it goes into the, the capital account as a minus 100 million, and it goes as a plus 100 million as a credit sale we call it, or bank account by the bank in the financial account. So as you can see. Minus and plus. Okay. So, how does the balance of payments balance? Remember, the balance of payments will always be in balance, by definition. And this is because of the double entry of every transaction. It will balance with the following equation. Current account plus financial account plus capital account is equal to zero. Or, current account plus capital account is equal to minus the financial account. Okay. This is the way we report it. So, and you will see in a bit that it doesn't always balance. So, we use a, a trick to make it balance, which we call a statistical discrepancy. <coughs> Let's take each of the, of the elements to understand what, what is in it. The current account. The current account balance has three different components. The trade balance, income received from abroad, minus income paid abroad, and transfers made abroad, minus transfers received from abroad. The biggest chunk, though, by far, is the trade balance. And the trade balance is exports minus imports of goods and services. So let's take each of these. Goods and services, we have here the three types, uh, the three type of transactions in the, in, in the current account, and credit and debt. So goods and services, what is credited? It is the exports of goods and services. So I'm exporting a car, or I'm exporting uh, professional uh, consulting, for example, that's credit. Uh, I'm importing uh, soya beans or I'm importing uh, medical uh, services, so that's an import. Uh, primary income, on the credit side you have investment income received from foreigners and compensation of employees at home received from foreign firms. So if you have an employee at home who's working for a foreign company and his compensation comes from the foreign company, that is counted, counted as a credit under primary income. If you have a Saudi national working abroad and is being paid by a Saudi firm, that comes under, under debit in primary income. And if you have uh, an immigrant here who at the end of every month sends remittances home, that comes under secondary income transfers paid abroad as a debt and vice versa if uh, you are in, a, in, in the country from where uh, that person is and he is working and he's sending money in that country it counts as transfers okay. so that's that's the, the, the current account um, and uh, the difference between ex exports and imports we call the trade balance and the overall difference between credits and debits is the current account balance. One more thing. The primary income has two components. The investment earnings received and paid and the wages and salaries received from abroad. I talked about the employee who is paid uh, from abroad but there's also that I may have uh, for example, uh, uh, an investment abroad, and I'm getting income from that investment, that's a credit. So that's the first one, the investment earnings received. The secondary in 
income is often expressed as a net income basis, transfer receipt minus transfer paid. And as I said, remittances is a big part here. And for some countries, of course, this is a, a very important uh, element. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Remittances is a normal transfer. The remittances <laughs> is not if I suddenly decide to transfer 100 euro to, to somebody, but if there is a, at the end of a month, for example, you have, uh, you're working here, but you send your remittances home, that is counted in the secondary account. So this is uh, the US current account. And you can see, this is 2014 data, and you can see, uh, Okay, somebody run me run through this and tell me which items are particularly important in the US and what is the US position in the current account. Investment? Investment? There's no no investment here that I know. This is where? Investment income. Not investment, investment. Uh, that's income from investments, but not the foreign direct investment idea. That comes in the financial account. Mm -hmm. So this is, I am a person, and I have a foreign investment, and I receive income from that investment. For example, I have shares, and they pay dividends. That's, that's that. Sorry, yes, somebody was... Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Yes, this is good and good and service exports. So 2.3... Uh, and if you look down here, you will see goods and services imports, 2.8. So immediately you see the U.S. is running a trade deficit. Okay. So I'm comparing 2.3 with 2.8. Now, this 2.3 is broken down into goods and exports, and there you can see clearly that goods is much more important than, sorry, uh, yeah, goods and services. And there you can see clearly that goods are more, more important than services. And the same thing with inputs. Goods, inputs, and service inputs. Goods, inputs are much more important. Then you can also see that the trade balance is much more important than primary income or secondary income. So the primary income is only 823 billion as opposed to 2.3 trillion. Okay. The number is wrong. Sorry? And this number is wrong. First number is wrong. Which number is wrong? It should be two, three, four, four. Round error. <laughs> yes. Well, when you when you don't have the the full, uh, there's always round error. Yeah. Good point. Uh, so uh, you can see that it was a trade deficit. You can see also that in terms of let's compare primary income receipts with uh, primary income paid. So there it's got a, it's a surplus, okay? And secondary income receipts, 140. Secondary uh, income paid, 250. That's a, that's, a, that's a deficit, yes. That's why Trump is against government trying to make the in the US in order to get Yes, and this is part of the trade dispute. This is what is driving a lot of the trade dispute, and we'll see in a bit discuss whether a current account is a bad thing or not, okay? uh, because a current account deficit and a trade deficit by itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Okay? Nothing in economics tells you that a trade deficit is a bad thing. It is, of course, if uh, the trade deficit hits particular parts of your economy, those will hurt. But overall, and we'll see why once we talk about the financial account, trade deficit in the current account deficit is, as long as it's not very big, is not a, a negative thing. So this thing the, at the very bottom shows you the, the net after you take everything into account. So the net current account is negative in the US, was in 2014, to the tune of almost 400 billion. Which means what? Sometimes the deficit consider healthy. Yes. So, what does that mean vis-à-vis -vis the rest of the world? It means.
means the U.S. owes. Oh, it's, it's, it, is, it means the U.S. is borrowing from the rest of the world. That's what it means. And it cannot be doing that without getting something back. And that something back comes through the financial account. Bonds, um, exactly. Yeah. Assets that are bought. That are so, just before we do that, here's a graph mm -hmm. of a number of countries. Uh, I picked them on purpose. I picked one country with deficit, and all the other countries with a surplus in the current account. So, you see that the US has a deficit, and in 2005, the deficit actually became rather large, and now it's less so. And here you see with the, with the surplus, Germany, Japan, China, and Saudi Arabia. So, this is a current account deficit. So it is trade plus primary and secondary payments. But yes, it is mostly trade. Yeah. But not in capital. Not in capital. Not in capital. That's a, 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 a corporation of the company there. It will depend what happens 
with its uh, profits, what happens with the flows of goods from that, because that company is no longer, uh, the company will be a broker. So the question is, the owners of the company, if they are in Saudi Arabia or another country, are they getting the money? Okay. That's what is reported in financial analysis. So, now when we talk about assets in the financial account, let's make it a, a very important distinction. There's a first class of assets which goes under foreign direct investment. And that's the, the real investment. Investment in real assets. Meaning, you know, bricks and mortar, basically. So businesses that, that one buys. Uh, factories, real estate. As opposed to portfolio investing, which is intangible, and that's investment in stocks and bonds and other paper assets. Now, this does not mean that the second is less uh, important than the first, okay? Uh, but it has a very different nature. And we'll see that one of the key differences has to do with how volatile it is. FDI, if once you invest, if things go bad, you can't just pick up and go. So it, so it is much less volatile. Uh, sorry. But the other portfolio investment, if you have bought stocks in the, in the stock market and tomorrow morning you wake up and you think the stock market is going to crash, you just sell because it's liquid and you get out. So many countries are worried when, when part of, where a large part of their financial account is made of portfolio investment, not enough from foreign direct investors because they are vulnerable to sudden changes of mood. And that can be destabilizing, and as we will see, this has been part of what has driven many financial crises. So, um, other assets take a variety of forms, but they're mainly back on. So, lending money in a foreign country can be in the form of opening a bank account or through other intermediaries. That's, that's the third, apart from foreign direct investment and portfolio investment. So, coming back to the volatility. The concept of volatility is how easy it means for a flow to reverse. Okay? If it is not easy for a flow to reverse, we say that it's not volatile. If it is easy for a flow to reverse, sorry, if, we, if, if it is not easy, it is not volatile. If it is easy, it is volatile. So volatile inflows can increase risk. You suddenly have a huge inflow, this may be nice, but tomorrow morning it could become an outflow. And uh, <coughs> easy in, easy out, as opposed to foreign direct investment, which takes time, energy, uh, commitment, uh, and the, the volatile flows are associated with what is called sudden stops. So if a country suddenly there is a crisis of confidence. We think that tomorrow morning uh, this country is no longer trustworthy. Uh, it could be for political reasons, it could be because it's economy. We suddenly read the report that the economy is not doing very well. So from one day to the next, this country may have what's called a sudden stop because all the liquidity will simply get up and go. And this is what has happened in many countries, including my own. Uh, with capital just voting with its feet, as they say, moving very quickly. That's money. Sorry? That's money. Yes. And this is why when a country is picking up, is coming out of a crisis, you will see that there is a trend in terms of the capital who comes in. The first people who come in are the people who are looking only for very liquid assets. They say, I want to invest in the stock market in the top five companies and I want to be able to leave you know, in 24 hours. Then they get a little bit more comfortable. They say, okay, maybe I'll invest in something which is not that liquid. And only when they're comfortable with the country is when they start investing in when the real FDI comes in, which is more long-term strategic and 
arguably more important for the long term. 